she was a victim of domestic violence. Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to resonate with victims as a whole, that obviously covers the animals as well. You know, my sister was cut up in a similar fashion to these animals are. My sister died in the most fear that you can imagine. And this happens every single day at an exponential rate to these animals. Okay, so here we have uh, Jacob Silver. And uh, Jacob emailed me uh, this week, I think it was. And he had a very interesting story, Jacob. So I just wanted to get you on the channel to uh, discuss your life. And like you had a very interesting upbringing and you have a very interesting transformation story. And I'm really interested with these transformation stories because if everyone knows I come from a, you know, some, like a pretty interesting background myself and I have a transformation story. But Jacob, thanks for coming on, mate. No, thank you for having me, brother. I mean, I've been feeling connected with you for quite some time and I just was naturally drawn to reach out. I feel like now is the perfect time more than ever to have these type of conversations. So I appreciate you holding space. No worries, man. No worries at all. Now, like, obviously no one probably knows who you are on my channel and I don't even know who you really are and where you come from. So let's just go back to like your, your, the start of your life. Like, where do you come from and what are some of the challenges you faced? And yeah, like, let's go to the beginning of your journey. So I am from Providence, Rhode Island, the yeah. East coast of the U S smallest state on the map. A lot of people don't really even know where it is. They, they hear Rhode Island and they think, oh, like Long Island, New York. But no, yeah. it's, it's its own state, its own city. And yeah, so I was born here in Providence, Rhode Island. My father was incarcerated within the first two, one to two months of me going home from the hospital. He was a violent offender. You know, went to jail for things, you know, possession of gun possession. Uh, Gun possession, you know, use of the gun, sawed off shotgun, that whole sort of thing. My mom was handcuffed to the table. And the only reason why I know this in detail is through the stories I've heard from my mother and my sister, as well as going through my sister's diary that she let me read. And we'll, we'll touch back on my sister in a second. But so moving on from there, you know, fatherless child in, in, in an inner city, just like anybody else is, you know, bit of a bit of a normal story here. Grew up really poor. I saw homeless shelters through elementary school, you know, going back and forth on the public bus to get to school you know, stealing out of the corner store just to eat because we were a bit hungry. My mom struggling with not only her personal challenges, but, you know, financial woes as well. Leading up to about 12 years old, where I started using cannabis and started becoming a product of my environment, you know, getting into some crime, getting into selling drugs, using drugs, becoming an addict. And, um, getting arrested for the first time as a juvenile in a raid and then getting arrested again as a juvenile being in a stolen car and just making very poor choices, you know, and at this point I'd only met my father twice. And then the first time he was on the run in two States and he somehow found us in, in Providence and he had a baby with another woman and told me that it was my fault if I didn't let him stay that he would have to, you know, leave the baby somewhere, which I'm pretty sure he did. And I think about that to this day, you know, leading up through school, getting into trouble, getting kicked out of multiple schools, you know, drug addicts, making poor choices from cannabis to pill usage, to heavy alcohol usage, psychedelics, cocaine, you know, you name it, pretty much everything but heroin because my, my father was a heroin addict. And even though I became him in every other aspect of my life, I didn't allow myself to become him using heroin. You know, I turn 18. I find myself in the in the prison system. I get arrested as an adult, you know, okay. felony substance one, intent to deliver, violation of probation, you know, obstruction of justice. You know, you gotta do a mandatory sentence for that. So I did under under six months, probably about four and a half to five, depending on what you count as prison time, you know? And mind you, this whole time, I also been struggling with my health because I was born with a bicuspid aortic valve I have an immune disorder, which ended up being Bichette's, which is like an elevated version of Crohn's or IBS that affects different parts of the bodies. 
And I also got pericarditis for the first time at 17, which is where the sac around your heart gets infected and fills up with fluid. So now I'm fresh out of jail and still haven't learned my lesson. I'm still, you know, in the same neighborhood around the same people. And now things are even worse because I've had opportunities to, you know, sell drugs in a different fashion. And leading up to Christmas born in 2010, when I turned 21, my older sister, Staria, was murdered. I was a victim of domestic violence. And finding her like that was something that really changed me forever. And shortly after that, I got pericarditis for the second time and my heart stopped. Wow, dude, this is a, there's a lot to unpack here, man. Like that's a, there's, there's so many things leading up to, to, to the life that you led. And um, we, we'll get to your sister being murdered, which is an extreme tragedy and must, must cause you a lot of trauma. The, the way your life was growing up, do you think it had anything to do with not having a father in the home? Or, you know, you say we're a product of our environment. Um, seems like your family system at home was quite broken up. Do you think that's what led you astray? Or was it a combination of the family being broken up uh, and the neighborhood you were in, like the, social, the economic status of the neighborhood you were in and the people in that neighborhood? Um, what was it predominantly for you, you think? I think it started with not having a father and, and the home being broken. So yeah. of course you look outward and you look into your environment for maybe males to have an influence on you or even a sense of family. So, you know, similar to you, I was also in a crew and had my brothers around me who were similar outcast mis misfit type people. You know, maybe they don't have fathers at home. Maybe their mother is a drug addict or, or whatever the case may be. And we kind of bound together as family and we took care of each other, or at least I thought we took care of each other, you know? Yeah, there's that factor. And then also it's even a bit strange because I have a very feminine influence. I was raised by all women. You know, I don't know if you're into like the natal chart or anything like that, but I have a, a predominantly feminine, to, feminine influence over masculine. And I see things from that outside perspective. And I never really connected with a lot of men for that reason, I have a hard time trusting men. I never really had like a father figure just because, you know, I always saw men as having like a twisted outlook and, and very manipulative and possessive. Yeah, that's very interesting. I mean, I was raised by a single mother as well, but I did have uh, male influences, but, um, you know, I was, I was a bit of a people pleaser and I uh, wanted my friends to accept me. And uh, the male influences I had in my life were, you know, going down the wrong track themselves. And I tried to impress them and, you know, be the best version of the, the male gangster that I could and yeah, very toxic environment. Uh, one that's uh, filled with, uh, it's constantly trying to please the people in the gang and, or, or, you know, committing acts of violence or doing things to, you know, build a reputation. Did you see much violence growing up in that, that gang world? Like what was it like, uh, the violence aspect of it? Well, I mean, I saw violence even before that. I saw violence as a, as a child. Like I said, I was raised around women who were abused yeah and you know so i saw that that's a common theme and you look outside into your neighborhood and there's a lot of domestic violence out there and then of course leading into you know violence in the streets you know i, I lost friends at a young age i mean even i started losing friends as early as you know 12 13 14 whether it be to jail or the grave in middle school two of my closest friends one of them went to jail for selling drugs in the school and the other one went to jail for armed robbery Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I had friends that I had to un that same friend I actually buried. And, oh. you know, it's, it's, it's tough to lose the people that you come up around and it just kind of makes you more cold and, and desensitizes you to things. Even leading into veganism, you have such this self hate that sometimes it's hard for others to make that connection. And I think that, you know, even Gary would say that the people who were oppressed or had the most suffering tend to gravitate towards veganism a bit more simply because it just makes a lot more sense to them. Yeah, it's, it's interesting um, uh, knowing what it feels like to be a victim or a victim of your circumstance. It helps you understand the animal's uh, circumstance and empathize with it more. Well, for me, at least it did. And um, I'm sure that's one of the connections you made. Let's, uh, let's talk about um, like what happened with your sister. That seems, and that, that happened when you're after 18 years old. I mean, that must've been a, a shock to your system and like i don't know how to how i would deal with something like that so can you tell us a bit about that story yeah i just turned 21 november yeah. 3rd and it happened christmas morning in the same year so and here's the here's the part that really affected me the most was because of my past and my poor choices i wasn't there to be 
I wasn't able to be there for her in the best way possible because I didn't know about anything that had happened. So I had gotten out of jail. I was living in the next city over and I was kind of doing my thing, just hustling, you know, you know, gun possession, that whole situation, paranoia, greed. Mm. And they didn't tell me about anything that was happening, you know, because prior to this, there had been some violent altercations. There was obviously a um, no contact order, restriction order, restraining order, sorry, placed on her attacker. And when I had saw her, I came back to, I went through a, a breakup right around the time of my birthday. So I came back to the city where she lives in. And I saw her for the first time in a bit of time because, you know, I had been so outcasted by my poor choices. So I saw her for the first time and she had this new hairstyle. I'd never seen it a day in my life with this hairstyle. I didn't really think anything of it. I just kept asking her like, why, why'd you make the change? Well, come to find out was she was missing a huge chunk of her hair from being okay. put through the tiles and the, on the shower wall by this man. And nobody told me. And at the time I was homeless, which is, you know, a bit of a common theme in my life since I was a kid. And she kept asking me like, Hey, you should stay here. You should stay here. But never really telling me like why I should stay there, you know? And they were just afraid that if, if I found out that I would do something crazy, which, you know, fair enough, yeah. I probably would have, but I would rather go down defending my loved ones in the same way that we do the animals than, than go out not doing anything. And so I didn't stay with her because I was an addict and I was making yep. poor choices, you know, and I didn't want to be a burden on people. I was just so, I felt terrible about it. You know, I just went through this breakup. I couldn't stop using, you know, I'm making poor choices. I'm in the street still. I'm around the same people. I am the company that I keep. So I told her, you know, I can't stay here with you. And 11 days later, I found her, you know, slashed into pieces and gray in the face. And watching my mother picking up her daughter, you know, yelling to the sky and, and having to physically pull my mother off of my sister, you know, definitely led to some heavy PTSD and changed my life forever. That is, that's a horrific story. And like, you were the one who found her? You, you guys were the one who's, who found your sister? Yeah, well, we were going to, we were, we were all gathering anyways, like yeah. for, for holidays, as like the one time we make sure to get together, you know, especially like at my situation, you never know what's going to happen to me. So we get together as much as possible. So I was, I was actually literally getting dressed and my mom, I remember like it was yesterday, I was throwing my shirt on and um, we were smoking a joint and my mom had called me for like the fourth time, all super concerned, you know, stressing about not, nobody has heard from her since this time last night where she was making cookies and, uh, prepping the food because me and her we come from a background of cooking which is something we can tap into after but so we, we always had this thing of like who can make the better dish you know and I was gonna go over there early to finish cooking so she's like hey can you go and check on Staria that's your name and I'm like yeah no problem and when I got there the door was open and you know as soon as you got there you obviously knew something was wrong it was a very eerie vibe the energy was totally off. The smell was completely off, obviously from the amount of blood and that sort of thing. And mind you, she just had children, twins, twin girls. So oh she's, she's there on the floor and no more than 15, 20 feet tops are her children screaming in a crib who have been by themselves since three to four that morning. It's now probably 11 a.m., and, you know, the father of the children who's, is who committed this crime, and he's obviously nowhere to be found. And so you have this reaction of like, well, here's my sister. But there's also these babies. And, you know, you're freaking out. And then my mom gets involved because she shows up as well, you know, because she couldn't, she didn't want to wait. She just had this motherly instinct to, to just go. She didn't want to wait for me because maybe I'm, again, I made poor choices. Maybe I was slacking. Maybe I would take a bit of time to get there. And. Yeah, now it's this, this trifecta of children crying, finding your sister and your mom in this state. Oh, God, that's, uh, how did you feel at that moment? I mean, I, I couldn't imagine it. Like, and you, you said that she was, that the, the attacker had cut her up or something. Like, how yeah, did you find um, her? Like, in so what state? The, the first incision, or if, if you want to call it that, you know, she was actually sleeping. And she was very paranoid about this. So she was sleeping with a knife directly next to her. Yeah. You know, right at the nightstand where you would keep your tea or whatever it is that you keep on your nightstand alarm clock, there was a knife. 
and she got very close to grabbing the knife because you can see by the way the uh the blood trails so she gets sliced pretty deeply with the first cut and in her sleep then there's a tussle and the worst part about it was my sister had so i have two sisters and me and my other sister are very much alike and then staria and my mother are very much alike and they're very linear and they have a, a great fear of death as of me and sonya are more tapped into the tribal aspect of it and, and spirit side so she had this great fear of death so she died in the most fear that you could ever imagine you know with your children crying and you're you're, you're bleeding out she, before she could bleed out she died of you know um, asphyxiation which is where you choke on your own blood and so yeah there was a tussle it was a struggle and she got she got hit a couple of good times and she died there on the floor oh my god that's uh, what a horrible way to die and um it must have been a heavy weight to bear seeing as you said uh you know you didn't stay there for your own reasons and did you did you f blame yourself for a while after that i mean i could only imagine the psychological aspect of you know feeling like you weren't there for her i mean obviously you had you couldn't control this but like that right. still wouldn't have helped your trauma about that how did you deal with that aspect of the trauma i have I don't want to say have because I'm doing a lot better now, but I had very heavy survivor's guilt hmm. for a long time. It really affected me of like, you know, the what ifs, what if yep. he came in the house and I was sitting there? Like, cause if they, honestly, if they told me what had been happening, I would have been like, okay, not only am I staying here, but I'm never going to sleep. I got my pistol here and I'll, I'll stay up no matter what. And if, if something happens, I'll be here and I'll, I'll, I'll take action accordingly. So I always think of like, I would, throw, I would throw my life away in an instance for the women that raised me, you know, the people that taught me how to be a man and, and allowed me to become this person that I am today. So I had very heavy, you know, survivor's guilt from that. Of course, PTSD of the visual aspect of it, the graphic side of it, mm. but more, even more so the emotional aspect of seeing your mother so distraught and then seeing, you know, these, these twin girls having no mother or father like I, my life was difficult enough and i had a mom and two sisters they have an uncle and they have an uncle and aunt and a, and a grandma who have like done their best in the past 10 years to to rekindle a, a family bond you know and i won't lie for the first couple of months i i kind of i don't want to call it a relapse because i never really was super sober to begin with but i fell down you know i went down the rabbit hole down the drain real heavy for a good yep. five months i didn't even really address the stuff that was hidden within you know i, I remember burying her and asking my mom well what do we do now and she said we go home and i was just so confused like baffled you know we go home and we leave her here in the ground like is that how this works and i went home and i got really drunk i used some drugs and I shouldn't even do cocaine because of my heart condition, but you know, got down with some of that. I got real heavy into like, you know, Percocet, Oxycontin. Yep. And then at a point in time in my life, I just tapped into what they had taught me as a child and the power that I have. And I just got sober, cold turkey, you know, never went to any sort of clinic or anything like that. And I just stopped doing everything and, and put my stuff towards something better so obviously because of the trauma and the you know and the grieving you started to hit the drugs and the alcohol and this is quite normal for someone to try to you know blanket those feelings i used to do it all the time as well i mean but something like this this is this is on another level and you're saying you got you hit rock bottom or you sunk really low and, mm -hmm. you, and then all of a sudden you just had this kind of like decision where you just decided to be be sober talk about that decision because you know that decision that decision just doesn't come easy for people you 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 had some type of awakening or like epiphany like talk about that yeah it was definitely an awakening for sure i mean i had i had been raised with you know spiritual type upbringings and just self empowerment and obviously i was i'm a self taught kind of individual so i always had strong beliefs but my actions never aligned with what I was taught. And so one day I just made the choice. I remember that the last day I got really drunk and high, we went out to the casino, the entire time in the car, me and my, my good Greta, 
We are drinking in the back seat, kill the bottle before we even get to the casino, get to the casino, drink after drink after drink, pills, pills, pills. I get into a fight. I get beat up, you know, because I'm so out of it. I can't even lift my own arms. You know, somebody has their way with me. I puke everywhere. And the reason why I got so intoxicated was because the next morning we had this memorial type service where we, at the local park where they do neighborhood day where we all grew up. We're doing this thing of where we walked around the neighborhood as a, as a community, as a whole. Right. Everybody coming out of their house walking for my sister because she was very loved in the neighborhood. I might have made poor choices, but everybody loved Staria. She was like everybody's sister, you know? So the whole neighborhood is outside walking for her. And at the end, we, we let the balloons off into the air, which obviously thinking back now is terrible for the environment, but it, it was more symbolic, you know? Yeah, of course. Yeah. And I remember just dreading that so much. That's why we got so crazy. And my mom being so disappointed in me when I was showing up the next day, you know, half puking and my, I'm pale and you could see it in my eyes. And she told me I look like my father. You know, in his later days, because he turned into a monster, because he used to be a great person, my, my sisters would say. But once he got onto the heroin and the alcohol and started swinging those guns around, it's a different story. He's a survivor, they say. And so, yeah, I started to make better choices. And then as I began to make those choices and I was traveling, doing music and trying to find an outlet for just what I was feeling, boom, I get pericarditis for the second time and my heart stops. And I have to get the epidermic needle into my chest to pull the fluids out of the sack of my heart so that I could come back to. And I remember waking up. That's when it really happened, you know, waking up. And this is all relatively close to, to my sister dying. This is like in the same 10 months, you know. And that's when I was like, OK, I really need to reassess my life. I've been gifted this opportunity to breathe every day. You know, I'm, I'm open to receive and I'm deserving to receive. And I need to take these opportunities and be just so grateful for them. I need to make better choices. So that's really where it all started. Wow. Wow. It looks like, um, yeah, like the things that preceded um, the awakening sort of contributed to the awakening. So you had, your, you know, all this, uh, you, you know, you, you're growing up in this neighborhood. You, you had your father as sort of you know, this figure in your life, like uh, you're, you could either be like him or not be like him. So that's a realization. And, you know, being around domestic violence and your sister falling victim to the domestic violence and to the point where she loses her life. And then you're using substances to sort of deal with this. And then you have this sort of life threatening moment where it gives you the realization, Hey, you could lose your life. And have you lived according to, you know, have you, have you paid your life sort of, what it deserves or are you sort of wasting it away? And that's, that's when you decided like, this is it. I'm going to be, I'm going to be sober from this point onwards. Or was it a progression to being sober or was it just like bang? No, well, I, I really asked myself, am I satisfied with the life that I'm living? Mm. You know, emancipate yourself from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. Right. Yeah. So I went sober. I went sober that day instantly yes. went through withdrawals you know, the whole nine, I'm sure you can relate. And yeah, at that moment, I was not only sober, but I became a voice for injustices that I strongly believed in. So I began getting involved with domestic violence in my neighborhood, you know, obviously making the connection to veganism and getting immediately involved. And that. I also went vegan overnight. It wasn't like, a, oh, you know, we'll, we'll eat a little bit less animals. It was like, no, I, I get it. And I need to make action right now. You know, like yeah. once 20 seconds ago, I was a non-vegan, but right now I am vegan and that's not going to change. So talk about, let's talk about your, um, seems like you're a doer, you're a man of action. So when you have the awakening, you take the action. That's a strong person that you're a strong person for doing that. Uh, not many people have that type of conviction. Let's talk about how you, woke up to what was happening to animals like how did this come into your life it's almost like you know it's it's bizarre because it's like you had these this is what happened to me basically i had these series of like you know awakenings and veganism happened to be one of those it's almost like my my, my mind was open to change mm -hmm. and how am i how am i going to do better and veganism was one of those things because what's happening to the animals obviously i don't want to hurt people don't want to hurt animals i'm trying mm -hmm. to do better what was it like for you like how did this seed come into your mind 
So a lot of these things happened at the same time as I was yeah. just reflecting on myself and thinking about how do I practice what I preach? How do I align myself with what feels right in my core? And obviously, you know, feminism was a part of that. Nonviolence was a part of that, you know, breaking apart the societal norms, you know, classism, it's all a part of it. But in order to really engage in those sort of things, we have to have a oneness and we have to also recognize veganism, which was actually probably the most important one to me. And a lot of people will say like, oh, well, you're only so passionate about this because of your sister. And it's like, don't, don't project it like that. Use it as a form of inspiration and, and a form of understanding. Because once I realized that it was, I have life, I don't need to bring death into my life. I was gifted this life. And what am I going to do with it? And then you get informed because, you know, everyone's like, everyone just needs to be more informed. And I don't really know if that's necessarily true because we all know right from wrong. Right. And, you know, generally speaking. So then I really got informed about these things and what happens in the slaughterhouses, the living conditions, the rights violations, and then noticing the parallels between the suffering that not only I went through, but a lot of people in society today are going through. And then it's like, Oh, you're anti-violence. Well, fantastic. Let me tell you about something that's right up your alley. Then, you know, mm -hmm. veganism is for you. If you're anti-violence, Oh, you, you believe in feminism. Let me tell you about something that's right up your alley, you know? And I just began to perspective is huge for me. So the second that I started to see some of these things and these images and, and reading about them, I started to put myself in that position. And it's like, yeah, sure. I'm a fatherless kid. I've seen prison. I've seen violence. I've had, you know, guns pressed to my head by the police, all these different things. However, I, I have never been enslaved my entire life. Nobody's exploiting me for my body parts. You know, there's not this, this vast genocide of my people right here in the now. Of course, there's been, you know, genocide of the indigenous and terrible things like slavery and, you know, <laughs> leading all the way up to the police system and, and that sort of thing. But the animals just have this, this deep calling for me. I always considered myself an animal lover. You know, everyone always joked around and said I was like, you know, the dog whisperer, like all the mean dogs in the neighborhood always were, would gravitate towards me naturally because people say, you know, I have, I just, energy doesn't lie. And I have a, a solid energy. So I was considering myself as animal lover, but here I am with, you know, cow in my sandwich and mm -hmm. pig on my plate and I'm eating eggs every day or, or not every day, but whatever it is, I'm just enjoying these things. And that hypocrisy is, is huge. And also like you had a, you know, a family member murdered. I've had a, I've had a family member murdered as well. My uncle was uh, found, he was stabbed dozens of times and he was found a week later and my father suffered uh, great PTSD from that. Um, having that type of loss in your family, especially a forced killing, like it was not, it wasn't like, okay, they, they didn't look after their health and they died of some terminal illness or something like that, which is still horrible, but to have someone be murdered in your family. And then, you know, although like pigs might, might not be as aware as a human being, they're still aware of, you know, they're suffering and they don't want to die and they're sure. screaming and in, in, in that, that fear. And you spoke about uh, your sister may have been in this fear and, you know, you've got this level of connection to that, that other people might, might have just, they just might not have, have experienced before. So ha does that play into your empathy for the animals as well? Sure. I mean, think of it like this. So my sister, I hate to use the word victim, but you know, let's just be clear about it. She was a victim of domestic violence. Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to resonate with victims as a whole, that obviously covers the animals as well. You know, my sister was cut up in a similar fashion to these animals are. My sister died in the most fear that you can imagine. And this happens every single day at an exponential rate to these animals. You know, whether it be thrashing around in a gas chamber or, you know, getting their, their throats cut, you know, bolt gun to the head or any of these things that happen. You don't think they're afraid of these things. You don't think they have this deep fear of their oppressors. You know, I, I find a lot of freedom fighters will are always, you know, fight the power anti-establishment, you know, against the man. But it's like, well, the man is killing animals and, and, and tricking you into eating them. 
and, and you fell right into that trap and now you're defending the oppressor, which is what we need to, to break those chains of, you know? So I think all of those things really play a role. It's just, I don't want to be contributing. I realize account, I'm very big on accountability. I'm sure you are too, as far as like, you know, being a drug user and having, making poor choices, we're accountable for that. We need to make better choices and self-empowerment is huge. You know, knowledge is power, but applied knowledge is empowering. And that's something that I truly live by. So yeah, I'm here now, I'm never going to go back on it. Yeah. It seems like, it's like when you make the connection in one aspect, it, it almost like it opens up the floodgates and you're just like, that's there. It's there. It's there. Uh, coming from neighborhoods like we're from, um, you said, you know, you, you said like, you know, domestic violence and violence was normal and gang violence and having a gun and doing drugs. And, you know, your father was imprisoned for this. And like, this is all like when you, when you're involved in a neighborhood like that, that's the only reality, you know? Mm -hmm. So when you pull yourself out of that environment, you kind of got to learn, okay, this isn't normal. This is actually wrong. Like, you know, like, okay, well, okay, yeah, I can see it more now that it's wrong. Okay, these people are victims. It wasn't just me going around doing these things. There was consequences to those actions and people around me were upset. My family were upset and, you know, and, and this is like veganism too. It's like, okay, like I, I could have that burger. It tastes good. It's pleasurable and it's easy. It's convenient. But there's a consequence to that action too. Like I don't want to see animals be butchered and killed, especially like when you're in the gang world, you know, people might rob you or they might have wronged you or, or your friend, even though like it might not, it might be a perceived wrong or they, they've wronged me. So mm -hmm. I've got to retaliate or if we don't defend ourselves from this gang, then we're going to be victims. Animals are truly vulnerable, innocent beings. They have not harmed anyone. They're just living their, well, trying to live their life or being forced into a life of slavery. Um, so, so like the vulnerability of these animals and the innocence of these animals really plays on my mind too. Cause even as like a gang member, like I still wouldn't like to see the innocent deliberately harmed, you know, mm -hmm. what, what happened in gangs, it was usually gang on gang. I mean, there were some innocents that got involved, but generally speaking, there were some codes you abide by. Like, and if you've seen someone just attacking a dog, then you'd probably punch him in the head or something, try to defend the dog. So yeah, like it's that aspect of the innocence that really plays on my heart. And do you feel the same way? Like it's. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even connecting it to the neighborhoods that we grew up in, I'm not sure if it's the same way where you're from, but you know, non-active non-gang members, they're, they're civilians yeah. and they play by a different rule. You know, they yeah. can speak to law enforcement or if they get happen to get hurt in the streets, then it, it's, it's a problem because they weren't involved. They have this, this sense of innocence that you spoke on. Yeah. And in that sort of aspect, these 100% of the animals are fall under that civilian category. They have done nothing to URI. They have done absolutely, they haven't done anything. They're yeah. not, you know, causing problems or creating wars or writing laws that put people in jail systemically or anything like that. We wage war on them simply because, hey man, bacon, we love, mm. we love the way it tastes. And to me, that was so asinine that I just really was so disgusted about it. I could never see myself putting money towards, you know, the, the murder of innocent beings who have done absolutely nothing. They just want to live in the same way that, you know, you or I or my sister wanted to, you know, my sister was just trying to raise children and, and do the best she could in the neighborhood that she lived in. And she died as an innocent woman. So now would I stand up for her in, in one aspect, but then say, oh, you know what? The animals, F them, sacrifice them for, for whatever means it is, you know? It just doesn't make sense to me. No, no, truly. It's almost like there's a, there's a level of discrimination between species that, um, mm -hmm. and this discrimination has severe consequences for the animals. It's like, well, they're a pig. So yeah, you know, they can just be chopped up and who cares about their screams? Oh, but you know, uh, there's a monkey here being exploited in a, a medical lab and most of the public, oh no, don't do that to the monkey, you know, but, uh, y you know, the chicken, get rid of the chicken oh the bald eagle american eagle. it's just like this level of discrimination and it happens between human beings of course now there's a big anti-racism movement in america which is great sure. it's getting people aware of racism and you know racism still exists and it's more i guess it's there's overt racism but there's more covert racism and people are going to have to analyze that within themselves so they mm -hmm. are they having these discriminatory views between humans and I want to, I want people to extend that to these animals too like cuz this this right. discriminatory mindset is being used against animals having 
catastrophic results. Like where are 3 trillion humans a year being murdered? I mean, if you include sea animals, this, this is like a Holocaust unlike any we've ever seen mm-hmm. ever. And, you know, I just think like the, the results of this discrimination have been like just on another level. And you know what's really mind boggling as well? So like I would say, let's say 80 to 90 to 95% of vegans all resonate one way or another with human rights issues, whether yeah. it be racism, classism, feminism, whatever you want to, whatever you want to pick. But 95% of human rights activists don't even acknowledge veganism. In fact, yeah. if you go to one of these rallies, you probably celebrate with, you know, cheese pizza or burgers or chicken wings. And I don't really, I, I that's, it's been actually. Why, why is that? Me. Why do you think that is? Because do you think that, um, because in one breath we say like, you know, groups that have been oppressed historically are more likely to gr- uh, resonate with other oppressed groups. Do you think maybe there's just a lack of education within these um, other movements? And if they had the education, they would be more likely to, because I guess like if you're a victim of racism, that's more in your face, you know, if a police officer is targeting you, you're going to be, that's more in your face. But with the animal oppression, you know, they, they fall into the same indoctrination that everyone else has. And, you know, there's just not the education. Do you think that these, these groups might be more susceptible to the animal rights message given the right, if it was given the right light there? I would really like to think so, but as time goes on, I don't really, I, I lose faith a bit. I hate to say that, but yeah, you know, I see, it just doesn't make sense to me. You know, if, mm. if you're battling one thing that's right in your face, what's more right in your face than, especially in the neighborhood that I live in, every block, chicken mm. stand, McDonald's, Wendy's, whatever, you know, Spanish food, Haitian food, Trinidadian food, Jamaican food, Fantastic. Celebrate your culture. That's incredible. Don't forget your roots and know your history. But at the same time, let's be a bit more conscious of what we're doing and who we're supporting. I mean, even in Fed Hill, which actually we're going to protest in a couple of days, they have a live chicken market. Nobody bats an eye. And it's in like the most ritziest section of my city. Mm-hmm. Federal Hill is like you know, the biggest street for like the biggest restaurants and the Italian culture is, is, is major there. And a lot of money is generated in this part of the city. Yeah, right on, right on the street, live chicken market. Go in there, pick your chicken, pick your rabbit. And they'll, uh, they'll behead them right there for you, skin them, send them, send you on your way with a bunch of, bunch of packaged parts of animals. And- yeah, I mean, it's. I'd really love to see um, more of the the human rights activists, uh, you know, including animals into the, the you know their circle of compassion. And I know the vegan movement is very big on intersectionality, which in principles I think it's great to you know I don't think you should be anti-speciesism and pro-racism i mean that's just illogical and largest there's no logic in that and you know i think that they need to be educated on i just don't see how you could make this the connection through speciesism and still be a racist Mm -hmm. i mean um that i think speciesism helps unlock that discrimination i mean i'm sure it still happens some people are just they've got a blind spot um, but yeah, I think like the more we all think about all of these issues together and include the animals in this, like include mm-hmm. the animals in this, cause they're suffering beings as well. Um, the, the better the world will be. So what have you, like, what have you been doing in terms of your, your activism and like, cause we've gone through your story, which is an amazing story and you seem so strong and switched on and for, for going through such, such a hard time. And now you're using your voice. Um, you, uh, for the animals as well um talk a little bit about that yeah so honestly the the fight for the animals has become probably my biggest purpose in life i'm more purpose driven than ever and i think you know folks like you or i who go through certain things we really need to find our purpose and find what resonates with us and then just follow that vision blindly and, and don't accept the the woes of society and just continue fighting that good fight so even connecting that to anti-human messages, no matter how many times I spoke up against other injustices, the second that I spoke about animals, you know, oh, you're, what are you, anti-human? Like what, you don't see the intersectionality of these other issues? And it's like, well, no, I can be, I can be active in both sides. But as time goes on, I've, I've learned to really tweak my approach and get more direct with it, which is actually why you know, you and I have been brothers way before this conversation ever happened because you were one of the people who let me know that the feelings that I was having weren't necessarily wrong ones. So I started off doing 
you know, outreaches like anybody else would, whether it be on my page, you know, talking to the camera, getting out in the streets, talking to people. Um, I was big in event coordination from doing music, you know, growing up and I would, I would do events for veganism, you know, vegan food. And I ended up getting into nutrition, not really directly connected to my veganism, but because I was so sick that I wanted to self empower myself, I got, you know, certified in nutrition, you know, became, I guess you would consider me a lifestyle coach and you have all these like, I don't want to disrespect anyone, but you know, the ex vegan crowd, the, the apologists like uh, Elise and Rob Vanna who made handfuls and handfuls and handfuls of money off of the insecurities of people doing life coaching. When I believed in it so much, I was doing free consultations, you know, two, three, four hours a day for people trying to go vegan, people trying to eat more plants. I would get on, give the people free hours of time. And I was consistently doing this, getting on the computer every day, writing people recipes because I also grew up in a kitchen and I made the conscious choice of never will I cook another animal product or, or butcher another animal again in my life. So then I ended up moving into vegan restaurants and I've opened up um, multiple restaurants with owners and I worked in California, I worked here in Providence, numerous ones, even the first vegan food hall I just opened last year, um, I was a major part of that. So I'm writing people recipes and I'm getting out there and I'm hitting the streets and I'm making, you know, coconut yogurt parfaits and giving them out for free and taking this approach of like, everything has to be inclusive and trying to pander to people and not really be super direct about it. Like, you know, just whisper it in, kind of sneak it in. Well, you do know about the animals, right? But have this parfait and have a lab and everything is so love and light as the spiritual crowd likes to say, but you know, even roses have thorns and you have to respect those thorns. So over time, I realized that I was doing a, a disservice to my activism and to the animals. Cause I don't, you know, like I said, I wasn't making money off of lifestyle coaching. I don't work for anybody. I work for, you know, like you said, I work for the pigs, you know, I'm not here to become rich. I stopped doing what I was doing before with my LLC to do this full time. My goal is to do this full time start touring and, and get more involved as much as I can. So transitioning from being super inclusive to being more direct and holding a mirror, stop using, um, you know, use, stop using language that's soft, euphemistic yeah. language, you know, mm. and telling you exactly what it is, being direct, because that's, that's real honesty and real love right there is, is telling you exactly, when I was making poor choices, people were just enabling me yeah. and you know, nobody, that wasn't a showcase of love. That was just, you know, we want, want to keep you down here with us. So yeah. now it's just, I'm out there speaking my truth and living my truth. My whole thing is if you don't live your truth, you might get caught in a lie. And I've lost a ton of followers, ton of friends, and I'm okay with that. You know, it's like what's no longer serving me has to be shed. And I'm not here to make abusers feel comfortable. I'm not here to make you feel okay with the poor choices that you're making or give you, you know, good news on bad habits. When I spoke up against domestic violence of my sister, I would never tiptoe around violent and abusive men so that nobody feels shame or guilt, you know, but, but guilt can be, guilt can be important. It can be infect, effective in the sense of like, hey, I am accountable for these actions. How can I make changes to stop these actions? But if I never tell you, or if you're never told, or, or, or you're never taught that these choices are awful, you're never going to know. I mean, obviously, the information is all out there, and it's a, it's a great level of ignorance as well. But that's yeah, my journey. Yeah, they're fighting a battle, though. Like, this is a thing. Like, I think being direct is so much more effective because you save everyone a bunch of time. And, and you got to remember the level of conditioning people are under. Like, it's just it's just crazy. So like the, the lessening the amount of time you have to explain this to someone is good. Obviously you can be your, use your own personality and you know, you can be polite, but you can be polite and direct, <laughs> you know, and, and say, Hey, you know, an animal was butchered and killed for that. Do you know what happens in the dairy industry? Boom, 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 boom. And when right. you pay for it, you're, you're, you're sort of paying for something that you're morally against. Boom, direct, simple. I mean, I don't know how you could be upset with that. Some people still will be. And I think like, yeah, obviously, if you go too far the other way and pander too much, then you've completely lost your message. And what's the point? 
Right. What's the point? Um, you know, and, and like you said, with domestic violence, we don't, we don't tiptoe around the issue. I mean, there's, all, there's psychological ways of, you know, addressing situations and you have to take certain things into account, but you know, people need to be held accountable for domestic violence and for, you know, I needed to be held accountable for my violence. I was committing to people when I was in gangs and, and, you know, I feel like I've learned and I've changed and I'm not doing that anymore, but without any level of accountability, without me getting thrown into prison with some real people or some real gangsters and mm-hmm. going, wow, I don't want to be here, man. Cause I could get something could happen to me. Like I've done to other people, you know, um, that, that level of accountability, we need to take that in order to change. And if we don't have that any level of guilt for doing something, why would we wouldn't even have a moral standard in society if there was no guilt, you know, of course, you know, people might think about reacting in a violent way, but there's a, there's a level of control because, okay, well I'll go to prison or I don't want to, you know, harm this person, you know, too badly. There's always a level of guilt that keeps us in check. And that's what our conscience is for. So I think speaking to that in other people is powerful, man. It's powerful. And you might lose some friends at the start, but the real ones are the ones who are going to start going, wow, man, he's speaking the truth. This guy's a truth speaker and they appreciate that, you know? Yeah. You know, what's crazy too, is that a lot of people, especially guys from my neighborhood are just people who have been following me for a long time and were resonating with the message of, you know, self-empowerment, taking care of yourself, nonviolence. Now they hear the message that I'm saying now, like I just put up a video of a spoken word that I did called meet the victims. And I edited the video because it's, it's like I'm narrating a story. So when I edit the video, I put all kinds of images of, of animals and how they're treated. And in my opinion, and I'm sure your opinion as well, the, the visuals that I chose were actually pretty tame. You know, we've seen some, some pretty heavy stuff, you much more than I, and I got a lot of hate for it. One person was like, you know, I, this isn't the way, so as we're, we're debating, I ask him, well, in your opinion, what is the way? And he said, oh, well, it's all about education and teaching people that, you know, violence is bad and teaching people that our food system is rotten and teaching people how to make better choices. And I said, you know what? Sure. I respect that perspective. So about that, what are you teaching people? Or what are the people around you teaching people? Oh, right. To eat animals. All right, cool. Let me go back to what I was saying. And we'll start there, you know, because I'm just trying to teach people. And just because you have the mirror held up to you, and I don't do it in a way where I'm like insulting them personally. This isn't something to get emotionally attached to. What you should be getting emotionally attached to is the suffering of the animals. Why are you not seeing it and being like, you know, it's not about being right or wrong for me, but just about, oh, no, that's wrong. I hear you. I'm also angry. So here I am with my voice, you know. And if you don't want to speak up, at least just don't support it and start there. Align yourself with your moral compass. You can't say one thing and then do the other. And that even goes with the the human rights as well. It's like, I don't really want to hear too, too much about a lot of other things if we're not taking action and if we're kind of being a hypocrite as well. And that's just how I feel about it. Yeah, no, and I think we should be consistent with that too. And yeah, I mean, what part of what you were doing wasn't education. I mean, it's all education. Um, a mm-hmm. level of responsibility has to come into education as well. I mean, if you're educating someone on racism and you're not just going to say, Hey, the, the system is racist without, without addressing individual racism as well. Sure. Like I agree, the system is bad for animals. The system is uh, bad for um, these beings who are being systematically tortured and killed, but the individual is also responsible as well. And we could say the same thing about, you know, aspects of racism within the system. And, but we've got to tackle individual racism as well, you know, <laughs> you know, so the, the, like addressing one without the responsibility factor is an error. <laughs> you know, we're all responsible. Okay. There's some things in the system that are out of our control, mm-hmm. but what is in your control is your personal contribution to, you know, what's going on. And, uh, it's, it's education. I don't understand, understand why, it's, why it's not. I think what it is, is because when you hold someone else responsible, then they have to be forced to change. But if you, sure. just, point, if you just point to the problem out there, there's no, there's no motivation for that person to change. But you're, you're, you're essentially motivating them. And there's another point too, like if someone's angry with you at the start, it's usually because it's usually you said something true. And um, you know, I've had a lot of people being angry, angry with me initially, but the more they watch me and they, they, that emotion subsides, uh, that's when the message starts to sink in, you know? So that's probably what you will face too. Um, but it's a long journey, isn't it? Yeah. And I'm here for it. I mean, this is exactly what I signed up for. I honestly think that I, I don't like to use the word like wasting time, but I do feel like I did a disservice by taking multiple approaches, you know? Cause honestly, I just want to do what works best. 
Okay. So whatever is going to, you know, flood the message out to the masses, I'm there for that. Even if it's not the approach that I'm taking, I'm willing to adjust and change. So I tried all these other things and they just didn't seem to be working as much. You know, no one had a, a single word to say against me when I was doing free consultations and making food for people and spending my time writing all these recipes for people and going shopping with people. I was like really trying to be by people's sides and helping the people. And then I got to a point where I'm like, is that, even that is kind of a supremacy fallacy where I'm just focused on helping people and I'm not actually helping the animals as much. I'm not really telling them exactly what they need to hear. Like, sure, um, I know some activists don't like to hold people's hands and they're not gonna tell you what to eat. You know, I happen to have a wealth of knowledge and a lot of experience in this, doing this for over seven years and helping myself and, and many others. So if you have a question, or, you know, I can help you out and send you in the right direction. Absolutely. But that I can't let that dilute my message or not even my message. Cause I don't, I don't have an ownership over it, but the message of let's end the senseless violence and this okay. enslavement that has been going on for too long. Genocide is happening every single day. And we just kind of brush it off as if it's not that important, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. It's, it's, it's a fine balance. You're trying to speak for the animals from their perspective and trying to navigate the human communication as well. And, you know, I'm not always perfect at it, you know, because it's a hard, it's a hard line to balance. You, you want to be speak truthfully from the position of the victims. You want to do them the justice mm -hmm. and you want the listener to hear you. So you don't want to do things that really stop them from hearing you, but you, we really want to, you really want to hit that sweet spot. And where is that sweet spot? I don't know. There's debate about that. So I think just, just follow your heart as well. As long as you feel like you're speaking for the victims, follow your heart. We're all different personalities. We'll, we've all led different lives. Um, but like, uh, would you say that because of the, the struggles you've been through in your life, uh, the life that you've led has made you a stronger person today and a, maybe a stronger voice? Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like that I have a, a value to this scene, to this, to this community and I'm honestly not here to please other vegans. The funniest part is I probably engage in, in combative communication with more vegans than anything, you know? Yeah. You know, obviously, yeah, you have non-vegans who, you know, can get a bit upset. But a lot of the time, it's within our own yeah. community where they're, they're bashing on me or, you know, what approach is better? Is there a happy medium? You know, I don't want to just sit around and give out vegan cheese and not ever mention the animals, you know, that's just not what I want to do, you know, yeah. and I can speak from that, speak on that from experience of like, oh, I've already done this and this is not working. Yeah. So let's move on to getting direct. And especially as someone who has suffered, you know, and someone who has been oppressed, someone who has been through a lot. And I think that that makes me relatable, you know, when I used to do public speaking, a lot of people would, would resonate with me versus like, you know, some of the more privileged folks or some of the people who didn't have to go through adversity. Mm -hmm. So I think that that is where I fit in as far as locally, you know, I can yep. get into these neighborhoods and connect with, with brothers and sisters that I know or that I don't know and let them know that we've been doing a severe injustice in the same sense that the system has been doing a severe injustice to us. That's, that's what we need to really uh, remove the blinders of. Amazing. And, and I think that you're a valuable voice in the movement because you can build rapport with people that others just can't build rapport with. And this is why the, the movement is vast and we have so many different personalities and so many different groups and so many people vote focusing on different things. But I agree, we need more people just focusing on the animals and the injustice. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if they want to go to a vegan page for a recipe, they exist as well. So sure. if you're an animal person and you want to speak for the animals, speak for the animals if they need a recipe you can direct them to a vegan recipe page or if you're a recipe and an animal guy do both do both i mean if you're a, I, I like i like i don't know why we can't do all of these things but why would we exclude the most important thing which is the message that keeps people vegan right. that gets people understanding the injustice people are asking us to exclude that i don't i don't want to exclude recipe videos i think they're really valuable like once they learn that you know animal abuse is wrong they need a recipe <laughs> you know right, but right. 
I, I don't. I, I just think that don't we? We should not exclude this message, and and the, uh, especially what what would we call it? The the effectiveness of the message too. Like we don't want a diluted message. We want it to be strong, you know, because it's a strong issue. It's a very strong issue. So we want it to be strong. We don't want to dilute it to the point where it loses all its meaning and people don't take it seriously. So yeah. I mean, in order to create radical change, you have to address these things head on. Yeah. You know, we, we wouldn't address other injustices with this little like tiptoe, super soft language. You know, even I see the hypocrisy, like we're talking about domestic violence. It's, it's normal to teach women how to defend themselves instead of teaching men how not to do horrific things to women. And that's kind of the same core value that has with veganism of like, oh, well, let's just talk about, you know, a 30 day juice cleanse. Let's talk about the fantastic recipes. And I just want to be healthy when you're skipping over the entire foundation of the medicine. We start with what we're not going to eat and why we're not going to eat it. Mm. And then we move on to, all right, well, you know, I made the connection. I made a change. My life has shifted. Where do I go from here? Oh, well, check out A, B, C, and D. You know, if you like Ethiopian food, here's a, here's a recipe. You know, you like Caribbean food, here's a recipe. You like Italian food, here's a recipe. And then they're off on their way. And then once yeah. they fall in love with it, they can tell somebody else. Because like, what happens when they don't want to do the health thing anymore? Everyone goes through peaks and valleys in their life. They go through right. health journeys and not everyone sticks to a health journey long term. Like, what do they do then? Are they going to go to the steak the beef burger because they mm -hmm. weren't educated why they should avoid that. Or are they going to go to the vegan burger? Are they going to go get the, the mock meat? Are they going right. to go get the vegan cheese if they want a junk food binge, you know? So I think the health message is, is good and it's important, but it's not the core message because the core mm -hmm. message keeps people vegan and keeps people avoiding this injustice and speaking up for animals and understanding. And then, and then going out to spread the message. We want people to spread the core message too, to help animals. And I think all these things are, if you avoid that one core message, I think that's a disservice uh, for sure. Jacob, do you have anything that you want to say to everyone listening um, as a final thought, uh, maybe to inspire them? You know, you've got a, you, like I said, you've got a full on struggle in your background and you've overcome adversity and now you're out speaking for animals and human beings as well. Um, would you like to leave a message with everyone? I think it's important to just find your purpose, you know? Everyone is, is purpose-driven in one way or another. I think it's key that we resonate with the struggle of others, mm. whether that be the women in your neighborhood struggling, you know, whether that be the people who fall under the, the classism umbrella, whatever you want it to be, but you also have to connect the animals into that. We have victimized animals for so long that we don't even put them in the, in the victim category. You know, like we think of them as the same as this microphone that I'm talking into and the screen that I'm looking at Joey on right now. And I think that's the problem. We just need to reverse the idea that animals are commodities. And once you can do that, you can really align yourself to what you believe in. And then once you do that, hopefully try to be a voice for it, find your purpose and just speak your truth, whatever way that is. You don't have to be like Joey. You don't have to be like me. Find your outreach as an individual and just live your truth. Don't be afraid of what society is going to think and whatever negative out, you know, comments come your way because that's been, that's been happening throughout history. Be you stay true to yourself and be true to the animals. That's all I really have to say. That's an amazing message. Thanks so much for coming on, Jacob. Is there anywhere people can go to find you if they wanted to come check out your stuff? Yeah, so right now it's at Vegidemic, V-E-G-I-D-E-M-I-C. That's Instagram, that's YouTube, and I also have Vegidemic.com. Everything is being revamped right now. As I said, over the past year, I've lost at least eight, nine, ten thousand 10,000 followers. And I started a whole new YouTube channel to pretty much erase everything that I did before. So I'm starting it from scratch. It's been a bit of a struggle, but I believe in it. And I know it's going to all work out and fall into place accordingly. So yeah, connect with me anytime there. Um, I would really love to get, you know, your opinion as well. Others opinion on the spoken word that I just posted. It's a quick watch, but I think that it'll resonate. Awesome, man. We'll go check it out. There we, there we go. Thanks for coming on, Jacob. Thanks for sharing your story. You've, shown great resilience and you've been through such a struggle. I resonate with it a lot. I've been through struggles myself, but 
you know, I'm just um, really happy that you've made the turn in your life. You didn't go down the wrong road. You went down the right road and you're, you're out here now to live your life and help make the world a better place. No, thank you for having me, brother. And if anyone is from the Rhode Island, Boston area, please, you know, get together, whether you want to do some cube with us or you want to just do some independent activism, come and connect with your tribe and, and let your voice be heard. Again, many thanks, brother, for holding space. I really appreciate you and, you know, massive love. Thank you.